What's up, you guys, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Kendall. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. I use this podcast as a way to share my 15 plus years of knowledge as a personal trainer, to share what's real, what's not, to share my own personal experiences because I'm not perfect. I want to share with you the things that I do right, the things that I've gotten wrong, the things that I'm continuing to learn, and how I live my fitness through the studio and outside with all things fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle. So welcome, you guys. This is a really big week. This is race week. I'm sure you guys are pretty excited for me to stop talking about the 50K, but 50K is kind of a big deal. And when I haven't done something like this in... I don't know. I, I need to look it up. I don't know when my last big, big race was. I'm thinking four or five years ago, if not even longer than that, when I tried to do my last 50K. It did not go very well. <laughs> I do have one successful 50K under my belt, and then I've had to drop out of two. One was actually this race. I dropped out with six miles left because of a knee injury, and then um, I dropped out the second time that I did a race called Quest for the Crest, which is a crazy race. I dropped out about halfway through, if not even maybe a little bit before halfway, for some dehydration issues. So I feel like this particular race holds a lot of meaning for me. It's just my way of saying like, I can do this, you are strong. Push through those mental hesitations, those doubts that tell you that you're not capable of doing it because your track record for the last two races isn't good. So I'm doing this for myself just to do hard things. I'm really excited about it. It is this weekend, so the podcast episode next week is actually going to be a little bit different. I'm going to do a whole race recap on hopefully how well things went, but just to kind of give you a quick little overview, the race that I'm doing is called the wacky and wild 50k it is a 5k every hour on the hour for 10 hours so very different where instead of doing just a 31 mile race as quickly as you can it's broken up and then your score at the end is your commute you know what I'm trying to say, cumulative, <laughs> that is a very hard word for me, cumulative time from all of those races put together. Now, I am not going out there to win it. I'm not going out there to kill myself. I'm simply going out there to prove to myself that I can do it. My sister-in-law is going to come hang out. Of course, Dan is going to be there. I'm trying to get my mom to come hang out for a little bit with my nieces. So I'm pretty excited for it. Dan has told me he's not going to be there at the beginning because it starts at 7 a.m. I was like, just drink your coffee, take your time. It's a 10 hour race, get there when you get there. And so he'll get there a little bit later, but he said he's gonna try to do like three laps with me as my pacer. And I really just told him, I was like, really? The most important ones for you to do is when you first get there, cause I'll be excited to see him. And then I asked him to run the last two loops with me. So yeah, after having this on my mind for a really long time, I'm excited to see how it goes and kind of get over it. Um, and then the other really big thing before we jump into today's episode talking about magnesium is that next week, so what is this? Today is the 6th plus 7, the 13th, right? Is that right? Yeah, so next week on the 13th, we start a brand new training session at Fit Women's Weekly Live. Every eight weeks, we do a training block where we focus on new skills, a new assessment workout. People can always hop in at any time, but I understand that mentality of starting in when something begins, and so that you can kind of ride that way from start to finish and not start something in the middle. Because with Fit Women's Weekly Live, your one month begins when you sign up. It doesn't begin at the start of a training block since you can technically jump in at any time. However, I do want to extend a special invite for you guys to go ahead and get started so that you can start at the beginning of this training block. And if you're like, well, how do I know if it's for me or not? Give yourself four weeks. You can sign up for just four weeks of Fit Women's Weekly Live to give it a shot, test it out, do the workouts, go through the training block. And if at any time during that four weeks you go, this isn't for me, you can cancel. Heck, if you want to get your money back, you can get your money back. But I have a feeling that after those four weeks, you're going to see what makes training in Fit Women's Weekly Live so unique. 
Fit Once Weekly Live is not just a place where I put up workouts. This is actually my training program that I put together on a week by week basis to progressively make you stronger, help you get fitter, help you get faster, help you get leaner, help you hit your results. And in fact, we are not at the cap yet, but there will be a cap on Fit Women's Weekly Live membership at just 300 people. And I do that because I want this to be a personalized training experience. I don't want people to hope that they get caught out during a workout. I want to be able to call you out. I want to know your name. I want to know what your goals are. I want to know where you live. I want to know what kind of fitness equipment you have access to. It is not unique for me during workouts. Even if you're not live, because I know who does the workouts consistently to go, okay, I know that Jenny has a kettlebell instead of a dumbbell. So I'll actually say, Jenny, when you get to this workout, when you do it later on, make sure that you're doing it this way. And I love being able to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with my clients. And I feel like I want to maintain that. And that's what makes Fitness Weekly so different and what makes it such a premier training studio for women that you just can't get anywhere else. You can get programs, I can work with you. I've built programs in the past. It's a one and done, here it is, go have fun. And yes, those are great. But having that one-on-one -on -one experience with a trainer so that you get the accountability, you get the coaching that you deserve is very unique to the online space. And I'm not just showing you exercises, I'm actually doing the workout from start to finish with you every single day. Not that I expect you to work out every single day, but the training is laid out in such a way that you can increase your workout volume if you want to without getting overwhelmed or over fatigued. So quick little rundown. Mondays are interval Mondays. Tuesdays are total body strength. Wednesdays are upper body and abs. Thursdays are legs. And Friday is total body kettlebell. And then Saturdays are stretch and recovery. Again, I don't expect anyone to work out every single day, but based on what your training schedule looks like, you will have something to do to help propel you forward. And I'm even making training templates right now so that if you're like, I only work, want to work out three days a week, but I want to focus on getting stronger with this area of my fitness, I have a training plan so you know which workouts to do and how to outline your week. It's pretty cool, you guys. So I'll go put the descript or the link down below so that if you wanna jump into this eight week training session, you absolutely can. You can go ahead and get started and then come Monday, we are gonna hit the ground freaking running and I'm so excited. So if you're curious as far as what we're doing this week, since so the training block starts next week, it is all about the deload. I have talked about deload a time in your training, kind of between training phases, where you back off of intensity, you back off of volume, you back off of the weights that you use, you're moving your body and you're focused on staying in a maintenance phase, and you're letting your body fully recover before you jump right back up again. I don't recommend anyone going through one really, really tough training period, finishing it on a Friday and jumping straight back into a really, really hard training block again, just two or three days later. Your body needs some time to just kind of be one. Get your resting heart rate down, let your muscles recovery, recover, uh, let your body rest, and then it also pumps up excitement because you're not still tired from the last training block where you're going like, man, it's time to start again. You kind of let that zone come down so that after a week you go, okay, I'm itching to be pushed hard again. And so that keeps the momentum up and keeps you motivated to keep pulling further. So deload weeks, very important. So if you wanna get started, get off of your deload week and start seeing amazing results, you guys give Fit Ones Weekly Live a shot. Again, you got nothing to lose. If you don't like it, ask for your money back, but you're gonna like it because we get to hang out. If you like listening to these podcasts, then of course you're gonna like hanging out with me more often and getting the training that you freaking deserve. All right. So let's jump into this episode. I've got all my notes written down. We are going to be talking about the oh so popular supplement, magnesium. <laughs> what is it? Where do we get it? What does it do for the body? What different types are there? Because there are several different types. What side effects uh, can you expect? And is it safe for pregnant women or lactating women? I think that that's a topic that gets uh, asked a lot. So first off, what is magnesium? Uh, magnesium is a chemical element with the symbol Mg and atomic number 12. I don't think you expected that answer, but for all those science people out there, there you go. But it's also the fourth and most abundant mineral in the body after calcium, potassium, and sodium. It is naturally present in a variety of foods. It's available as a supplement and is an ingredient in anti-acids uh, and 
laxatives, which I will explain more on the laxative part in just a second. Uh, in your body, magnesium plays a really important role in helping more than 300 enzymes carry out different chemical reactions in the body, like building proteins, building strong bones, regulating blood sugar, regulating blood pressure, assisting in muscle and nerve functions, and it also acts as an electric conductor that contracts muscles and makes the heart beat rhythmatically. So obviously, it is very, very, very important uh, mineral. <laughs> uh, more than half the magnesium in the body is stored in your bones, and the remaining is in just various tissues throughout the body. So most of the magnesium you have is stored in bones, which is why it is so vital for bone health. So with that in mind, let's talk about the important roles of magnesium, broken down even more from just those little bullet points. So number one, bone health. 60% or 60 to 80% of magnesium is stored in the bones, and a study of 73,684 postmenopausal women from the Women's Health Initiative found that a lower magnesium intake was associated with lower bone mineral density of the hip and the body. So basically, if you are low in magnesium, there's a good chance that you could have weak bones. And right now, we are all focused on, not right now, but we should always be focused on making sure that we are taking preventative measures with our body to avoid osteopenia, which could later lead to osteoporosis. So I know that people are always pushing calcium, 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 but vitamin D and magnesium are also very critical in helping with your bone health. So if you think that you may be low in magnesium, or you think that you may be suffering from some bone issues, magnesium is something to look at. Number two, migraines. Magnesium is often prescribed as a complementary treatment for migraines because clinical studies have found that low magnesium uh, is often found in migraine sufferers. And I've heard this, I have a lot of friends who suffer from migraines and are currently trying magnesium supplementation. Uh, so one study found that randomized double-blind controlled trials have found that magnesium citrate, and I'll talk about that in a second, and magnesium oxide supplements around 500 milligrams per day taken up to three months were preventative against migraines. Did not just help Decreased migraine symptoms were actually preventative for migraines, and that's pretty big. Uh, in a, another randomized double-blind trial, 70% of patients who were admitted to the emergency room with acute migraine headaches were given either the usual IV treatments or an IV of magnesium sulfate. And the study found that magnesium was actually more effective and faster acting than typical treatment. I feel so bad. I have had one migraine and that was when i had the vid and i do not wish that on anybody so migraine sufferers i know are always looking for ways to prevent their migraines and to decrease their symptoms fast because they're debilitating um, from nausea to almost blindness to not be able to turn lights on oversensitivity of their senses i do not understand how migraine sufferers can walk this world you guys are amazing people if if that is you and so maybe magnesium might be able to help with that. However, more research does need to be done and make sure to talk with your doctor because the recommended dose for migraine treatment is higher than the recommended RDA, which we will talk about that because it may cause some other unwanted side effects. However, the unwanted side effects, I would gladly take over the symptoms of a migraine, but that's just me. But always talk to your doctor, you guys. And that should be the disclaimer for this entire podcast is that I am not a doctor. I am just presenting you guys some of the research that I have found. I have gone over Harvard Med, <laughs> finding this research, putting it together, looking at a lot of different research. But again, I am not a doctor. So just take that as you will. We're just talking from a nutrition uh, nutritionist standpoint. Number three, Depression and anxiety. I also know a lot of people that try to take magnesium for this. Magnesium assists in the neurological pathways that when not functioning correctly are believed to mood disorders like depression and anxiety. Um, but more studies need to be done because they've either really been inconsistent or they've been a lot of short-term studies or just the uh, groups that they tried to do studies on weren't very large. So while there are some studies that are promising that yes, this may help, some studies are like, uh, is it because of the magnesium? Is it because of something else that they're taking? Is it um, 
lifestyle, they're just trying, they, they got to find some more stuff. However, there is some research that shows that it may help with anxiety and depression. But it does definitely show there is a correlation to low magnesium levels and depression rates. Number four, blood pressure and heart disease. High blood pressure is a risk factor for, obviously, cardiovascular disease, and magnesium helps to regulate blood pressure. So, obviously, if you're helping to regulate your blood pressure, you are at better risk of avoiding cardiovascular disease. Um, studies have shown an association with magnesium deficiency and high blood pressure, which makes sense, but more studies need to be done because people that have a high diet rich in magnesium are also often rich in other minerals like calcium, potassium, so they can't quite say, do they have good blood pressure because of the magnesium or is it because they're making other smart life choices when it comes to their nutrition like having a multivitamin that's also boosting their calcium and potassium that could also lead to healthy blood pressure? Or is it because that people who are often taking multivitamins are also doing other smart things with their lifestyle, like exercising regularly or eating a little bit better? So they definitely need to do a little bit more research, but other population studies have shown that higher magnesium intakes and or high blood levels of magnesium are associated with a lower risk of stroke and death from heart disease. But again, it's also hard to separate the other nutrients of the same food. So, but that is promising. So if you, like there's no harm, right? I think that's what this is all about is, should you avoid talking to your doctor if you have high blood pressure and just take magnesium? Absolutely not talk to your doctor but making sure that you are getting all of the vitamins and minerals that you need, one of which obviously is magnesium, could absolutely be a benefit. And then number five, magnesiums, magnesiums, talking is sometimes hard. Magnesium assists enzymes that regulate blood sugar and insulin activity. And prospective studies show an association of diets low in magnesium with an increased risk of type two diabetes, which again makes a little sense to me because is it really because of the low magnesium or is it because that people who are at an increased risk of type 2 diabetes are most likely making poor health decisions in other areas of their life with exercise and uh, processed foods, high sugar that could also be causing it, right? So is it um, what what's the cause and effect really here? And is it really as simple as increasing their magnesium to help or creating those healthier lifestyle choices with the rest of their diet. So I think that that's really important. I don't think that magnesium should be looked at just like the one and all. I think that when you are getting all the vitamins and minerals that you need through a healthy diet, that that is going to help enrich your life in much more ways than simply just taking in the magnesium. Like the magnesium is just one part of what happens when you eat and you take care of yourself. I don't think that simply taking magnesium if you are not exercising and you're eating sugar and processed carbs every day is going to help decrease your risk of type 2 diabetes. Just some food for thought, right? <laughs> Speaking of food, uh, what are some foods that are high in magnesium? Now, one thing I will say is that a lot of people are saying that Americans are low. Well, not just Americans. A lot of cultures are low in magnesium because uh, the way that we do agriculture nowadays, a lot of our soil is depleted of these vitamins and minerals, so it's really important for us to supplement them. Um, but that does not mean that foods still don't carry a good source of magnesium. So magnesium is found in plant foods like legumes, dark leafy green vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and fortified cereals. It's also found in fish, poultry, and beef. As a general rule, I found this, that foods that are high in fiber are also high in magnesium. So that's kind of one trick. Um, but when you're somebody like me and you've cut your fiber down a lot over the past six months, it's important to make sure you're getting it from other sources. <laughs> so what are like specific? Oh, oh, and I also found that interesting that tap mineral and bottled waters also have good sources of magnesium, which really does, again, another thing I know I keep saying, which makes sense, but this does make sense because magnesium being like an electrolyte, a lot of waters are fortified with electrolytes. And so it would make sense that water carries magnesium. Uh, so what are some of the actual specific food amounts? Pumpkin seeds actually have one of the highest. So 30 grams of pumpkin seeds has 156 milligrams of magnesium. 
Chia seeds, again, 30 grams, has 111 milligrams. Almonds has 80 milligrams. Spinach, boiled, has 78 milligrams and a half a cup. Half a cup of boiled spinach is a, kind of a lot of spinach. Uh, and the idea of eating boiled spinach is really disgusting to me. <laughs> Cashews, oh my god, my favorite nut. 30 grams has 74 milligrams. And then peanuts, which I think, at least if you're in America, we eat a whole bunch of peanuts because peanut butter is like a whole nother food group, is a fourth of a cup of peanuts has 63 milligrams. So with those specific numbers, it's like, okay, cool, but is that really a lot? Is that not a lot? How much do we need per day? So I try to find, a, like I said, a reliable statistic on what percentage of Americans are deficient in magnesium, but every report I read was slightly different, and it ranged from 48% of Americans are deficient to 75% of Americans are deficient. But either way, it's pretty clear that most of us would benefit from making sure that we're eating a diet that has a good amount of magnesium, as well as possibly supplementing as well. So according to Harvard Med, the recommended daily allowance, the RDA, for adults 19 up is 400 to 420 milligrams daily for men, 310 to 320 milligrams for women. Uh, if you are pregnant, yes, you do still need magnesium because it's something that we just need for our bodies to run. And pregnancy, uh, pregnant women require a little bit more, going from 350 to 360 milligrams per day. And then if you're lactating, you don't need anything different than the standard woman, according to like the dietitians. Um, lactation goes back to 310 to 320 milligrams. Now, there is also, um, there is a tolerable upper intake level of magnesium taken daily that could cause some, I wouldn't say necessarily harmful effects, but uh, the UL for magnesium is 350 milligrams from supplements. So if you're getting like all your nutrition per day and you're getting your magnesium that way, and then you're taking a supplement on top of that, you don't wanna exceed 350 milligrams if you are not in a deficit, right? If you are in a deficit, obviously talk to your doctor, you might need more, you might need a whole nother kind of protocol in order to get that up, um, but High dose supplements can lead to diarrhea, nausea, and cramping in some people, um, but extra magnesium from food is safe because the kidneys can excrete it in the urine. So that was kind of interesting, food for thought. Just like anything, if you get too much of something, a lot of times your kidneys work. That is our filtration system to just poop, blow it out of your system and move on with the day. But you do want to make sure that you're not getting too much too fast through a supplement that could cause some unnecessary not so fun side symptoms, which is why if you want to try to take magnesium for migraines, you might want to talk to your doctor, or not might, you want to talk to your doctor, I've got to be a smart podcaster here with my words, uh, to make sure that the benefits that you get would outweigh the nausea and the diarrhea. And as someone who has played around with magnesium for years, I can 100% say that yes, if you take too much magnesium, is going to make you go to the bathroom. It is a very big laxative. Um, I have had a few instances when I was still trying to figure out how much my body needed where I would be running and then go, ooh, I got to get to a bathroom right now. Like there was no warning. It was like, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Oh my gosh, I got to go, which is why it's often used in laxatives. All right, so what types of uh, magnesium are there? I did not know when I first started taking magnesium that there's such a different variety of magnesiums and it all comes down to what they're combined with because you're never just going to get 100 percent magnesium magnesium does combine it has an ionic charge of i think plus one don't take my word for that don't that's not important here but it does bind to another um, element in order to be consumed by the body and so you actually have 10 that you can uh, oftentimes buy through drugstores or online, the first one being magnesium citrate, which is the most common and used to treat constipation due to its laxative effects. So for gut health, magnesium citrate might be for you. 
There's also magnesium oxide, which is often used for digestive uh, issues as well, but also with digestive issues like heartburn on top of constipation. It's given that the body doesn't absorb it well, so it isn't a good choice for those that are trying to raise their magnesium levels. So if you want your body to actually absorb it and have more magnesium in your bones, then magnesium oxide is not the choice for you. It's gonna be more for if you are just having some issues right now going on, you're constipated, you're having heartburn because you ate too much spaghetti, then you would want to take the oxide. Magnesium chloride, so this one's a salt, it is well absorbed in your digestive tract, making it a great multi-purpose magnesium. You can use it to increase your magnesium levels, you can help with heartburn, constipation. It's most frequently, uh, frequently taken in a capsule, but is sometimes used in products like lotion and ointments though there's not a lot of science that backs up that the body is really good at absorbing it through the skin so if you are trying to boost your magnesium um, levels or you're trying to get the most out of it stick to a, a oral supplementation whether that's pill or powder or liquid uh, then there's magnesium lactate it is easily absorbed and may be a little gentler on your digestive issues so if you do have diarrhea or issues with soft stool already, then this one would probably be a better choice for you. It's particularly uh, great for people who take large doses of magnesium regularly and don't really tolerate the uh, other forms. And so far, this is the best one, magnesium lactate, for those to help with depression and anxiety. And I'm also gonna assume that this would also be a really good one for uh, the um, migraine sufferers as well because you're not going to be able you're not going to get all those other crazy side effects and you might be able to increase the levels that you take then we have magnesium malate magnesium malate is absorbed easily and may have less of a laxative effect it is most commonly used for chronic conditions like fibromyalgia uh, but more studies need to be shown for this so again talk to your doctor do not listen to me and say, oh my God, I have fibromyalgia. I should start taking magnesium malate. Talk to your doctor first, but it could help possibly. Magnesium taurate, it can, it's hooked to an amino acid and research suggests that adequate intakes of taurine and magnesium a day play a role in regulating blood sugar. So this particular form might be beneficial if you are pre-diabetic or you're just really looking to have more control over your blood sugar levels. Uh, and it also helps to support blood pressure. So actually a recent animal study revealed that magnesium taurate significantly reduced blood pressure in rats with high levels, indicating that this might help with heart health. But again, keep in mind that that was an animal study and more human studies need to be done. Magnesium L-theonate, <laughs> this is a salt formed by mixing magnesium and theonic acid, and it is easily absorbed. So again, if you have low amounts of magnesium, and you're trying to boost it, not just trying to fix something that's going, like a symptom going on right now, like heartburn or constipation, then this form might be for you. Uh, it is often used for its potential brain benefits and it can help manage certain brain disorders like depression or age-related memory loss, which is pretty cool, but like all things, more research has to be done. <laughs> we got three more, you guys. Magnesium sulfate, frequently dissolved in bath water to soothe sore and achy muscles and relieve stress, it is often also included in skincare or lotion, but there's little to no research that this is actually all that fantastic. So maybe it could have a placebo effect, but if you really wanna get the most bang for your buck, again, take the supplement in oral form. Magnesium, magnesium glycinate is used for its calming effects to treat anxiety, depression, and insomnia. But again, more research needs to be done. But I personally take magnesium at nighttime for its calming effects and for it to help me sleep. And I am a big believer personally that it does help me. And I've been taking magnesium for probably... <laughs> Alex got me, if y'all don't know who Alex is, Alex is my BFF actually get to see her tomorrow. Um, and she got me taking it probably at least four years ago. We were on the magnesium train before the magnesium train was taken off. We were just sitting on the railway being like, when are you gonna let me on? Um, and yeah, we've been taking it for a really long time. So I fully support it in terms of my mental health and my sleep. Um, and then the last one is magnesium 
orotate, <laughs> which is a natural substance involved in your body's construction of genetic material. It is easily absorbed and doesn't have strong lax laxative effects. Uh, and early research shows that it can help promote heart health due to orotic acid's unique role in the energy production pathways in your heart and your blood vessels. Whew, that was a hard sentence. One study showed, uh, it was done with 79 people with severe congestive heart failure, found that magnesium orate supplements were significantly more effective for symptom management and survival than the placebo. So that is really promising. The only thing is, oh wait, where does it say too? Oh, it's really uh, popular among competitive athletes and fitness enthusiasts. Uh, enthusiast. But this one's a little bit more expensive, so people tend to back away from it, but it does have some really promising benefits. And we already talked about it, like what happens if you have too much magnesium? Well, you can run the risk of diarrhea, nausea, and some muscle contraction issues since it is a, um, helps with muscle contractions. But it's really hard to go over too much and your body will obviously let you know. My body certainly did. So the real question that you should ask yourself is, okay, am I taking the right type of magnesium? Well, one should be, should I take magnesium if I am not? And I think the data really shows that, yes, you probably should, but of course, talk to your doctor. And then after you decide, yes, I probably should be supplementing because just like all multivitamin, like it's just smart to take a multivitamin. So make sure you either have a multivitamin with a good dose of magnesium or take another supplement with magnesium itself. I do take a just magnesium supplement every single day. I don't plan on ever changing that. It does help me personally. Um, but then the question becomes, okay, I want to do this. Now, which is the right one for me? And that's where that list of all those 10 different supplements come into play and then pick the one that's right for you. If you don't have digestive issues, you don't have constipation, you don't have unbalanced gut uh, bacteria, if you don't have heart, uh, y'all, can you tell? It's about time for this podcast to be over because I can't speak anymore. If you do not have a lot of, what's the word that I'm looking for, where your food comes up, heartburn, <laughs> then you don't need to take a magnesium that's going to have laxative effects, in which case you want to turn more towards one of the ones that are easily absorbable and cause lax uh, less issues in your gut, like a magnesium malate. If, on the other hand, you do have issues with your gut health, then you want to take something more like magnesium citrate or magnesium oxide. So things to think about. And just like with all supplements, you get what you pay for. So I would not just recommend going to the family dollar and picking up a bottle of the magnesium from the shelf unless it has been tested and it has good reviews. But definitely make sure that you get a nice uh, qualified magnesium supplement. So there you go, you guys. Now I wanna know, do you take a magnesium supplement right now? Do you plan on taking it? Which ones do you take? And not only magnesium, just what supplements do you take? I haven't done an updated supplement podcast in a really long time, so maybe that will be a Friday Fit Quickie this Friday or next Friday, let me know. But if you have any questions related to this specific topic, let me know. If there's a topic that you would like to hear on future episodes, let me know that as well. Now remember, if you love fitness advice and workouts and you get the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast, then awesome. That's great. I wanna start working out with you even more often. I want you guys to be a part of my community outside of the podcast, and that's where I wanna extend that invite for you to come and try Fit Women's Weekly Live. This is the time to do it, because next week on March the 13th, we're gonna kick off a brand new strength session, and I want you to be involved. If at any point during your first month, you're like, nope, don't like this, ask for your money back. No big deal. But I know that you guys are gonna love it. Every single day, you are gonna be challenged. You do not need a lot of weights set of dumbbells, couple of sets. You do want a weight that's heavy enough to push you. And other than that, I will give you modifications to make sure that you get the best workout that you need. You don't need a barbell. You don't need full gym access. This is something that you can do in your gym if you want to, or 99% of Fitness Weekly Live work out right at their home and you can do it as well. So if you're interested, go click the link below. And if you have questions, let me know. All right, you guys, I have one more favor to ask you. If you love this episode, please share it. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, hit that like button, comment down below, and of course, share the link. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, leave a review, take a snapshot, and just share it. But make sure to tag me because I would love to hear your thoughts. And as always, 
Drop into my DMs with any of questions, topics, or just thoughts that you have in general. I would love to connect. I always answer to you guys, so don't hold back or email me at kindle at fitwomensweekly.com. All right, you guys, that's a wrap for today's episode. Take it easy, go take your magnesium, and I will be back in a couple of days. Oh, and wish me luck on the race, y'all. I am going to be um, recording it and doing like a vlog of the full day, so be on the lookout for that. I'm excited.